Well, I want to welcome everyone this morning to our online service. It was supposed to be a in-person service and online, but we got a bunch of snow last night, and so we thought it was good judgment to uh, just to continue doing online service this morning. Uh, we hope that all of you are home and uh, snug and uh, have power and uh, can enjoy this, this beautiful day God has given us by giving us this great snow. So anyway, welcome to this morning's service. I have several things that I need to bring you up to speed on. Uh, first of all, we have an outreach that is planned uh, for our community. One of the things that uh, we believe that uh, uh, we can be very helpful to our community with is supplying them with food and supplying them with clothing. And we are going to do that February the 13th, which is this coming Saturday, just the day before Valentine's Day. We wanna love on our community. And in order to do that, uh, we need uh, a lot of volunteers to help us. On, the thir on, on Thursday the 11th at five o'clock in the afternoon, we're trying to secure as many volunteers as we can so as to be able to put all the clothing out, sort it as sizes, so on and so forth, get all the food boxes uh, packed. And uh, then on the 13th, uh, we're gonna do nine o'clock to noon. And we're asking all of our volunteers to be here at 8 o'clock. We're going to have a, just a continental breakfast, just donuts and muffins and drink. Uh, so if you would like to come and help us for this outreach, we're going to try to stay very safe, uh, take protocols for COVID, and uh, we're going to make sure that we're able to bless our community come the 13th. So that's the 13th, uh, 9 a.m. until... Uh, noon and uh, February the 11th, 5 p.m. until we get it all set out and set up. Uh, again, a couple of things I need you to help me to do, and that is to get this word out to our community. Uh, this week, we're going to be taking flyers out to various parts of our community and posting them on windshields, passing them out to people to make them aware of this outreach. But without community awareness this is never going to work so please help us get that word out if you would like to help us deliver some flyers maybe even in your community your neighborhood to your friends or family you can come by the church this week and pick up a bundle of flyers and be able to go out and pass them out so uh, if if we can't get the word out this is not going to work so anyway enough uh, enough about our outreach on the 13th set up on the 11th for our outreach on the 13th um, Deacon nominations, we are in the month of February, and so this is the month that we will be uh, holding our business meeting, annual business meeting. We have nominations for deacon. Uh, as I've said year after year after year, we've got several people in our congregation that qualify for a deaconship, and if you would like to nominate somebody, please find somebody who is already deaking and nominate them. Put their name in the box. It's out in the foyer. We're going to run this a couple of Sundays. And so uh, if you'd like to make some deacon nominations, please do so. Uh, next thing that's on the agenda is today is Mission Sunday. And we had it all planned to show a video and, and give a highlight to one of the missionaries that we support in Honduras. Uh, but unfortunately, we're not going to be able to do that this morning because it's online only. And so deacon, uh, excuse me, a Mission Sunday this morning Please know that uh, we trust you to give and to give generously so that we can su keep supporting the missionaries we have on the field. Uh, we have so many missionaries that are scattered out around the globe that literally they depend on our financial support every week to help them to further the gospel. Next week, we are planning on having several in-person events. First of all, tomorrow night, we're going to have Monday prayer at 6.30 here in the sanctuary. And then Wednesday, we're going, to continue, we're going to restart our youth ministry over in the Family Ministry Center. And we're going to have a Bible study here in the sanctuary. I've been preparing for this for quite some time. And I think that it is going to be a very, very beneficial Bible study uh, on the book of Philippians, uh, the book of joy. And so I trust that you'll make your um, self available on Wednesday uh, this coming Wednesday to be able to uh, attend our Bible study. We will be streaming it as well. So uh, Philippians this Wednesday, Monday night prayer, and hopefully next Sunday, uh, barring we have a snowstorm, we will be back in person here in the sanctuary. We'll also be streaming our service. We're going to do all that we can 
to stay safe uh, Wednesday and Monday so that we don't spread this COVID virus. We've got uh, hand sanitizer, mask, and we're asking everybody to do their part. So again, that's the announcements we have for this morning. And we, we encourage you to give uh, to keep the ministry here afloat. Uh, you can go online to uh, trinitywnc.com slash give and uh, you can give your offerings, you can give your tithes, and we just encourage you to do that. Amen? Well, after all the uh, announcements, I've got a message to preach, and I think it's uh, something the Lord really wants us to hear this morning. So I encourage you to, to, to uh, put on those ears that are going to be listening to the Holy Spirit as He speaks to us. So let's pray before we uh, jump into the Word. Father, we love you. We thank you so much for the opportunity that we have to come together as a body of believers, Lord, to get your word inside of us. I know the Holy Spirit this morning is, is, is helping us to understand and to know this word, that it would change our lives. And so I pray for the anointing upon it in Jesus' name. Amen. So the title of my message this morning is Under the Microscope, and it has really spawned out of a message I preached a couple of weeks ago called Power Tools, and I talked about the tools that God has given us uh, in, in, in our tool bag, if you would, these power tools. One of them was the blood of Jesus, and so there is so much around the blood of Jesus I think that is misunderstood. I think sometimes we, we don't know all the things we need to know about the blood of Jesus, and so this morning I'm going to spend uh, the, the, the remainder of this service talking about the blood of Jesus and what the blood of Jesus does for us. It's this power tool that God gives us, and if we don't know about it, we don't understand it, how in the world can we use the tool? So this morning, under the microscope, um, whenever I was in high school, one of the uh, classes that I had was called chemistry, and I was the uh, first opportunity I ever had to look at things under a microscope. Under a microscope, uh, it's magnified to a, a power that you could see things that to the naked eye you couldn't see. And so I was amazed. I love the microscope. I've always uh, uh, been fascinated by putting things under magnification. And this morning, that's what we're going to kind of do with the blood of Jesus. We're going to look at it under a microscope. And we're going to see things that perhaps to the naked eye would be impossible to see. So under the microscope, let's look at the blood of Jesus this morning. In Leviticus chapter 17 Verse number 11, this is what it says. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement for the souls. So now here's God speaking to the children of Israel, and he's, he's basically telling them how important the blood of Jesus, or the, the blood is. The blood makes atonement. The blood is the life of the flesh. Without blood, there cannot be life in any physical body. The blood has to be there. If the blood drains out, the life drains out. That's just as true in the Bible as it is in a physical body. Blood flows through the Bible just as it does through the veins and the arteries of a human being. Blood flows through the Bible. How do you say, Pastor, what are you talking about? Blood flows through the Bible. The blood of Jesus Christ keeps Christianity, which that's what this word is all about. It keeps Christianity alive. Someone once said, if you cut the Bible anywhere, it will bleed because blood flows through the Bible. The blood is spoken of 427 times in the Bible. So it's easy to see that this isn't just some minor theme in the Bible. Without the blood, the gospel of Jesus Christ is, is dead. And if the gospel of Jesus Christ is dead, we are deprived of eternal life. There's no way to have eternal life without the blood. The blood is so important. Let me read you a few scriptures here. This is Jesus said this in Matthew 26, 28. He said, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Paul added this in Hebrews 9, 22. And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood and without Shedding of blood, there is no remission. He also went on to explain in Colossians 1.14, who bought our freedom with his blood and forgave our sins. In 1 Peter, this is what Peter says, 1 Peter 1.18, it says, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct, received by tradition from your fathers, but you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. 
This is what John added to this. We've read what Peter and Paul wrote. Now this is John. John 1, uh, 1, 1 John 1, 7, it says, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. The early church knew and understood the blood. The 22 sermons that are rec recorded by the four preachers in the book of Acts all give the same message, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They understood his death. They understood it as making the provision by literally covering us by the blood. It was the, the essential ingredient in the gospel, the blood of Jesus Christ. We've all heard the statement uh, probably that uh, uh, you uh, are purchasing something and you put a $20 bill down for a, uh, something that you bought for $19.95 and you say, this ought to cover it. This ought to cover it. This $20 bill for a $19.95 uh, charge, this ought to cover it. The idea of that is that this payment will cover it. It'll cover it. It'll keep it out of sight, if you would. That's the thing with Jesus' blood. Whenever God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to be crucified, you have to understand that his blood covered it. It was enough to cover it. Whenever God sent his son, the blood of Jesus Christ covered it. This is what the songwriter Wayne, Wayne Watson said. It's no kin to me. I would like for him to be kin, but he's not. This is what it says. His gaze always passes through rose-colored glasses every time that he looks on my heart. In other words, the gaze of God, whenever he looks at us, he sees our hearts through rose-colored glasses. Rose-colored glasses denotes the blood of Jesus Christ that has washed our, our hearts, has made them clean. So just the few scriptures that I've given, what I'm trying to do is give you a picture under the microscope, if you would, a picture of the blood of Jesus Christ. So maybe the scriptures we read, we can begin to see the picture of the blood. It's hard to see blood because blood is internal. There's a lot of blood right here on this platform, but it's all internal. To make it external, it, it kind of hurts. You have to be cut, you have to be injured, and that's whenever blood begins to flow. Uh, I've injured myself, I've cut myself so many times, had stitches in various parts of my body. I've been able to see my own blood. To make it external, it hurts. But the Bible paints with very broad strokes the blood on a canvas and then it paints with so minute details as God's word begins to break break down breaks down what the blood of Jesus Christ is all about literally to a cellular level the importance of the blood of Christ we see broad strokes we see minute detail we see the cellular level of the blood of Jesus Christ the importance of it to our life we can see this today but even more important, that God sees the blood applied to our lives and passes over us. The blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus. So let's put the blood of Jesus even more so under the microscope. Turn up the power and begin to do a forensic study. Then I believe we will begin to see a complete picture, a portrait, if you would, of the blood of Jesus Christ. So whenever you put the blood and you begin to turn up the magnification on the microscope. Whenever you begin to analyze it, one of the things that you're going to notice, and now remember, we're not putting the blood of Jesus under a microscope, but we're looking at the Word of God. We're seeing the broad brush, brush strokes, and we're seeing the minute detail, and even the cellular level of the blood through the Word of God. Whenever you begin to analyze the Word of God, excuse me, the blood of, the blood of Jesus Christ through His Word, the first thing that you're going to notice is the blood is perfect. The blood of Jesus Christ was perfect blood. The virgin birth of Jesus established the righteousness of Christ. Listen to a couple of things that were said in the Bible. Judas cried out. He said, I've betrayed innocent blood. Paul explained, for he, that's God, has made him, that's Jesus, 
to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Jesus knew no sin. He was innocent blood. Pilate said this of Jesus, I find no fault at all in Jesus. Jesus himself said this about himself. Which of you convicts me of sin? He was spoken of as holy. He was spoken of as harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. This is what 1 John 3, 5 says. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. A natural father would have imparted his sin nature The sin nature that had been imparted over and over and over as the generations came down, he would have imparted the sin nature of Adam to Jesus. So a natural father would have imparted this sin nature. And death would have provided redemption. The virgin birth is absolutely essential to the salvation of you and I's souls. So if if, if Adam's lineage would have been brought down to Jesus and an earthly father would have been his father, then Jesus' blood would not have been perfect. The Bible clearly teaches that Jesus was born of a virgin, and he did not have the original sin. Matthew quotes Isaiah the prophet saying this in Matthew 1.23, Behold, the virgin shall come, uh, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Jeremiah the prophet had spoken years before this. He said, the Lord has created a new thing upon the earth. A woman shall compass a man. It certainly was a new thing for a woman without a man to give birth. That's what happened with Jesus. Adam's nature is passed to the offspring by the bloodline of man. There were no impurities in the blood of Christ. Why? Because Everything about Jesus' blood was perfect. It was perfect because Jesus' bloodline came straight from the, from the Father who sits on his throne in heaven. So whenever you analyze the blood of Christ, whenever you put it under that microscope, you turn up the power, whenever you analyze it, the first thing that you're going to figure out is the blood is perfect. So whenever you analyze the word of uh, our, the blood of Jesus Christ under a, microfo- a microscope, you're going to learn one more thing as well. Whenever you apply the word of God, the, the blood of Jesus Christ, whenever you apply the blood of Jesus, you'll find that the blood is pure. It's pure blood. Whenever Dr. Curtis Houston was struggling with cancer on a number of occasions, he went through a treatment called chelation. Chelation is similar to dialysis in that The blood is removed from the body and sent through a machine that cleanses the impurities from it and then pumps it back into the body. This treatment prolonged Dr. Houston's life for a good long time. After his blood had been purged and germs, purged of germs, disease, and bad cells, it was then able to work against the enemy cells that were at war with his system. The blood of Jesus Christ is pure. The writer of Hebrews states it this way in Hebrews 9, 13, and 14. For the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for purifying of the flesh. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Jesus' blood is pure. When the pure blood of Jesus Christ is applied to a sinner, it provides cleansing. The impurities that are inside of our lives, it, it, it cleanses them. John explained, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. The song, I, I'm not going to sing it because I would butcher it, but it says... What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus, the pure blood of Jesus, is all that can wash away our sins. 
Peter wrote this in 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. It says, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold from your aimless conduct received by traditions, traditions from your father, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. And because it's pure, it's purifying. It's purifying. It purifies us. I went into this life of Christianity almost 41 years ago. And, no, I went into it 41 years ago. And I came in with all kinds of impurities. And whenever I, I entered by the blood of the Lamb, I'm telling you, I was made pure. Pure in the eyes of God. So, whenever you turn up the magnification on the, on the microscope... And you look at the blood of Jesus Christ, whenever it's applied, the blood not only is purifying, not only is pure, but it's perpetual. Perpetual means unending. The animal sacrifices in the Old Testament, they had to be done every year, once a year. All these sacrifices, thousands upon thousands upon ten thousands upon hundreds of thousands of animals were sacrificed every year for the remission of sin, for, the, for, for, for the, the blood of bulls and the blood of goats and the blood of lambs, so on and so forth, every year. They provided the forgiveness. They, for, they provided a pardon, but that pardon was only temporary because it, it pointed literally to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and, the, and, and his blood being shed for the covering of our sins. This is what it says in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 27. It says, who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices? First for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once for all when he offered up himself. So that scripture tells us that, that every time they offered these sacrifices, it just had to be done again. But then whenever Jesus came, the Bible says he did it once and he did it for all. Again, Paul tells us that it was neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered once into the holy place, having attained eternal redemption for us. That's Hebrews 9, 12. Jesus' blood is perpetually forgiving us. Once for all. It's unending. You don't have to make a sacrifice every year as in the Old Testament. Once for all. Hebrews 10, 12 says this, But this man, after he, after he offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. So Jesus Christ offered one sacrifice for sinners forever. The death of Jesus Christ literally set in motion this continual cleansing, if you would, for those that trust him. Continuously, continuously cleanses us. We're given the gift of eternal life that he purchased with his blood. And thank God we're washed once for all forever. I like that. I'm glad that we don't have to go every year as the Old Testament priest had to make sacrifices for us. But Jesus came once for all. The Bible speaks of the blood being everlasting, an everlasting covenant. In Hebrews, it says our faith in his blood, it all takes... Uh, is all it takes to settle it forever and ever and ever. Whenever it's applied, whenever the blood of Jesus, and this is what you're going to see whenever you look at the microscope, whenever you look at the word of God under the microscope, you look at the blood of Jesus under the microscope, whenever it's applied, his blood is unending. His blood is, it is unending and it's perpetual. This is what it accomplishes. Whenever you, look at the, whenever you look at the blood of Jesus under the microscope, the blood of Jesus is perpetual, but it is also powerful. Man, that, that blood is powerful. This is another song. I'm not going to sing it because, again, I would mess it up. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood. Would you over evil victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb 
There's power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Two old hymns that have been sung for, for years and years and years, but yet they give a description of how powerful the blood is and what it accomplishes. In, in Revelation 5, 9, this is what the Apostle John wrote. And they sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood. By your blood. We've been redeemed. There's power in this. It takes an amazing amount of power to redeem a sinful human being to a perfect God. It takes amazing power to do that. And there was power in the blood of Jesus Christ. In Revelation 12, uh, verse number 11, this is what it says. And they overcame him by the blood of of the Lamb. They overcame Satan by the blood of the Lamb. It takes a lot of power to overcome Satan. He's a powerful adversary, but he's, he's not as powerful as the blood. The blood is powerful. For centuries, false religion has denied the blood. They've denied the power in the blood. There's a lot of teachers out there that stand in absolute, complete opposition to what the Bible declares. There's power in the blood. In fact, there's some people that absolutely believe the blood has nothing to do with it. It's, it's not the red blood that flowed from the veins of Jesus Christ at all that sets us free. But I believe the Bible completely proves that wrong. This is Hebrews 11.22. And according to the law... Almost all things are purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. What it accomplishes? The blood is powerful. You look at it under the microscope, man, there's power in the blood of Jesus. There's also power in the blood of Jesus to do something that, man, I tell you, all of us need to understand how powerful this blood is to bring acquittal to us. Little joke here, there was a woman sat down on a studio, a photography studio a stool, and she looked at the photographer and she told the photographer, she says, do me justice. And the photographer looked at her and this is what he said. He said, you don't need justice, you need mercy. <laughs> I thought that was funny. Well, anyway, can't do justice, need mercy, see. And I can tell you, that's where we are. We need mercy mercy we don't need justice if we got justice if we if we had to pay for those things that we've done it would be death that would be justice but instead God has extended to us mercy he has acquitted us of our sins every one of us that have had that John chapter 3 experience where we became born again our sins were forgiven through the power of the blood of Jesus Christ we have been acquitted of our sins Acquitted is a very heavy word. It means to pay off, to free, to clear, to absolve. It has a far-reaching meaning extending from the past all the way to the future. So to be acquitted of our sins, literally to go free from what we should have had to pay for, that's acquittal. I, I got to bring this up. O.J. Simpson was acquitted of murder. And it can never come back on him now in, in any court of law in the United States. Not even if new evidence is brought to bear. He's been acquitted. You say, yeah, but I don't believe justice was done. I'm probably in the same place with you, but this is it. You and I are guilty. And we know we're guilty. And we don't want justice. We want mercy. O.J. Simpson walked out of a courtroom a few years ago and he was acquitted. He got mercy from the jurors in that trial. Whether he committed the heinous things that he was accused of or not, I really don't know. But this is what I will say. The things that you and I know that we've done the transgressions that we know we have committed we have found mercy in the eyes of God through the blood of Jesus Christ and we have been acquitted we 
We needed acquittal, and that acquittal has come, and that acquittal is permanent. Our sins are forgiven, and the Bible actually says our sins are forgotten. It says his mercies, those mercies that he gave me 41 years ago at an altar in Carlsbad, New Mexico, those mercies that he gave me and I became born again, those mercies are new every morning, the Bible says. Not only our past sins are covered, but our present, our future sins put under the blood whenever we trust in the Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus' blood cleanses us from our past sins, our future sins, the sins we may even commit today. In Isaiah 44, 22, it says this, I have blotted out like a thick cloud your transgressions and like a cloud your sins. Return to me for I have redeemed you. David spoke this uh, uh, too whenever he stated, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed your transgressions from us. He promised not to remember them again. God said this, I will remember them no more against you forever. Jesus' blood covers our present sins, both the sins of omission, the sins of commission, whether it be things we ought to be doing and we're not doing, whether it's things that we're doing that we ought not to be doing. These are covered fully by the blood atonement of Jesus Christ. Everything is covered. Everything. Everything is covered. Jesus' blood continues to atone for future sins. This is not to say that we can just go out there and sin. A truly saved person doesn't want to do that, doesn't have that kind of attitude. But we can know despite our very best efforts, whenever we do sin, it's by his blood, and then our sins are covered. In 1 John 1, 7, it says, But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us, listen to this, from all sin. Jesus' blood cleanses us from all sins. Jesus' blood conquers all sin. Acquittal. Acquittal. That's a great, a great thing. His blood is permanent, and it acquits us. Whenever you look through the microscope at the blood of Jesus... Whenever you turn the power up and you begin to look through the pages of this book, one of the things that you're going to see is something that I, I like to watch the Antiques Roadshow. I like to see things coming through the Antiques Roadshow and be appraised to find out how valuable they are. Some people carry in all kinds of things, and whenever they're appraised, you can see the disappointment on their face that it wasn't what they thought it was. It was a cheap knockoff, and it was only worth a few pennies, and they paid several thousand dollars for it. But it's also amazing whenever someone carries something in, and they think it may have value, and it's appraised, and all of a sudden it has great value. Whenever the appraiser backs off and says, this thing's worth $250,000, and, you know, the people tear up whenever they find out how amazingly valuable it is. Well, whenever you appraise the blood of Jesus... Whenever you look at it under the microscope and you begin to realize how precious the blood of Jesus is, how valuable the blood of Jesus is, whenever you appraise the blood of Jesus, you understand that it has great worth. We love to sing the song, Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. In Peter, in, in, in 1 Peter um, the term precious is described, the blood of Jesus Christ, but, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Peter said it's precious. The blood of Jesus Christ is precious. We know about preciousness. We have precious metals, precious jewels. We have all kinds of things that are precious. I can tell you in my family, I don't have a lot of precious metals or anything like that, but I got some precious kids. I got some precious grandkids. They're valuable. I'd do anything for them. I'd spend any amount of money. The blood of Jesus is precious. It's, a, it's precious beyond what we can understand. Let me give you a little story. I've read this so many times. I've used this in children's ministry sermons. I've used it in sermons, but I believe it bears repeating of just how 
precious something is. It's a story of a very wealthy old man who had an elaborate collection of Van Gogh and Monet paintings. His only son shared his father's interest in, in the rare paintings. They traveled around the world buying these pan paintings wherever they could find them. The son enlisted in the army and was placed in the medical corps. In a severe battle when carrying a wounded soldier to safety, his son was seriously wounded and he died. The mother was dead already and the news of the tragedy devastated the old father. He grieved in loneliness for months. One day, a knock came at the door and when he responded, he found a young man with a package. The young man explained that he was one of the several soldiers that his son had carried to safety. Knowing of his interest in paintings, he had painted a picture of the son and presented it to the father. The painting was not rare, but it was very precious to the old man because it was a good resemblance of his son. The man moved a very valuable painting from the mantle and placed the picture of his son in its place. Hour after hour, he sat in a rocker and gazed up at the image of his beloved son. When his death came, the art collection was put up for sale by auction. Hundreds of collectors came to bid. The auctioneer announced that the will stated that the picture of his son was to be auctioned first. A moan of disappointment could be heard from the crowd. Let's get, let's get on with the real paintings, one was heard to say. The son's picture was held up and the auctioneer cried, who will give me 100? Who will give me 50? Who will give me 25? There was no response. A kind old gentleman in the back asked, will you take $10? Sold, said the auctioneer. Good, cried the crowd. Now we can get on with the auction. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the auction, announced the auctioneer. The crowd was puzzled and upset. Then the statement was given. The will declared that the son's picture was to be sold and the person who took it would get all the rest. The old man who paid $10 for the picture of the son was suddenly amazed at the fact that he now owned all the valuable paintings. Whenever a person takes the Son of God, everything God has is included. I get to say that again. Whenever you and I take the Son of God, everything that God has is included. It's a package deal. We take Jesus, God gives us everything. We become heirs of God. We become joint heirs with Jesus Christ. You see how precious the blood of Jesus is? Whenever it's applied to our lives, whenever the blood begins to, to wash away the iniquities of our, of our past, whenever the blood of Jesus begins to cleanse us so that we might stand holy and righteous in front of the almighty God of this universe, we have to understand the preciousness of that blood. The blood of Jesus makes it all possible. Makes it all possible. We take the Son. We get everything the Father has. The last one that I want to look at this morning, whenever you turn that magnification up on that microscope and you begin to look a little bit deeper into the Word of God, you begin to see the blood of Jesus Christ, you understand that the blood of Jesus Christ is protective. The blood of Jesus is protective. In Exodus 12, the blood was sprinkled on the doorpost and the Jewish homes just as the Lord had instructed them to do. Whenever the death angel came, that fateful night, all the firstborn began to die. The awful judgment of death was upon them. The Jews that had put the blood on the doorpost of their homes, they were protected by that blood. They were protected by that blood. Now, I want to just kind of throw one in here just as a little kink. Because I've thought about this. Were they really protected by the blood? Well, yes, they were protected by the blood. But even more so, it was actually their faith in that blood that brought the protection. The faith in the blood. Whenever they painted the blood onto the doorpost, their faith in that blood protected them. They believed in the word that God had given Moses, that if the blood was applied, they'd all be okay. 
they believed it enough to act on it. By following the directions just as the Lord had instructed them, they reaped great benefit. This is what God said in Exodus 12, 13. Now the blood, of, now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. We still speak of being under the blood, being under the protection of the blood. The, the judgment will not fall on those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ and accepted him as Savior. I am under the protection of the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood has powers. If you, if, if you have not gotten under that protection, if you haven't accepted that blood, the blood of Jesus Christ, I tell you this morning, do so. Don't wait another moment. Don't wait till tomorrow because tomorrow we may not be here. Do it today. Accept that blood because that blood brings protection to our lives. I've just tried this morning to give you a, just a, a, a picture, a, a portrait of the blood of Jesus. A, a, what it looks like under the microscope. Whenever you analyze the word of God, I mean the blood of Jesus Christ through the word, you understand that the blood is perfect. It's perfect. It's pure. It's, it's perpetual. It's unending. The blood of Jesus is powerful, it's permanent, it's precious, and the blood of Jesus brings protection. So this morning, can you see the blood of Jesus Christ? Maybe just a little bit more than you could before we started this morning. Is it a little bit clearer? It's important for us to see the blood, but more importantly, it's important that God sees the blood whenever he looks at us. I quoted Wayne Watson. He has to see us through the crimson colored glasses that are only made available to him through the blood of Jesus Christ. Make sure this morning that you are covered by the blood of Jesus. Make sure that this morning whenever you take this long look into the word and you analyze the word and you analyze what's in it, and you see the blood of Jesus, make sure that you are covered by his blood because his blood is power. His blood is perpetual. His blood makes it all happen for us. Amen. Father, we love you this morning. I thank you for the word, Lord, and I thank you for what it stirs up in us, Lord. Father, for those that have just come into the kingdom and those that have been in the kingdom for, for decades, we got to understand how important this blood is. It's a tool that God has given us. And Father, I pray through the power of your Holy Spirit, you will help us to take full advantage of everything the, the blood of Jesus Christ affords us. We ask you, Lord, to be with us through this week. Be with us as we come together for Monday prayer and Wednesday Bible study and our Wednesday youth ministry. I pray, Father, that you will help us keep us safe through the power of the protection of the blood of Jesus Christ. We ask it and believe for it. Amen and amen. God bless you this morning. Thank you for joining us online. I hope that we are back in person next week. God bless you and have a great and wonderful week. Amen.